Uh, but yes, my name is Reti. I am from University of Copenhagen. I am a few weeks away of finishing my master's degree, so compared to the professor speaking before me, I'm still, in, I'm still taking baby steps. But I'm hoping that I can speak to you about a topic that is very close to my research, my work, and also I'm very happy to hear part of the focus of the Admiral Bellingshausen ship and the mission, which is climate change and improving our knowledge about climate change. And uh, I'm focusing on a little bit about how science has developed since the Bellingshausen mission 200 years ago up until today, and what are the impacts of climate change to Antarctica, and what implications do those changes have on the global cycles. So I hope I can give you a brief overview of that. Um, so I will start with 200 years ago, which we have heard a little bit about today already, the mission uh, by Bellingshausen and his crew. Uh, as we heard already, actually there were very few explorers at that time that were optimistic about discovering Antarctica. So it was actually the sealers, the, the ships that went there for commercial purposes to catch seals for their fur, for their skin, for the fat, that discovered many of the subantarctic islands. Uh, and compared to the hundreds of those ships, there weren't that many scientific research ships. And the Bellingshausen mission was one of the few at that time. So from 200 years ago up until we can say the beginning of the 20th century, there were some discoveries uh, of the different areas in Antarctica, but there was very little, not very little, but there was limited scientific development. But when the heroic era started uh, in the beginning of the 20th century with Scott, Amundsen, uh, Shackleton, that's when we can really see that the scientific development started to happen because, of course, we had some developments in the technology. Uh, so it was uh, Scott and Amundsen and Shackleton who first started to go inland in Antarctica. They started to explore ways to, of course, reach the South Pole, reach further inland stations to create more stable stations there. Um, and also there was uh, developments in, for example, aerial, pho not photography at that time, but they were able to rise up with balloons and see a little bit more of the surface of Antarctica. Uh, and they had very primitive ways of collecting data, which is literally carrying ice and rocks and sediments with them as they were skiing or walking or using the dogs. So everything was quite primitive, but they put a very good solid base to our understanding today actually about the geology and about the ice and everything in Antarctica. And of course then came the notorious race for the South Pole, which Amundsen did win. Uh, Scott did reach the South Pole also, but didn't make his way back, unfortunately. But that was such, a, such an inhumane feat, that, like a triumph in the, in the history of the scientific uh, development in Antarctica, because who knew that people can endure such crazy conditions? And that's also when overwintering in Antarctica became a huge, uh, became to play a huge role because spending the entire winter in this icy continent in the beginning of the 20th century where possibilities were quite limited in terms of technology and in terms of uh, how you can cover yourself and so on. So a lot of people tried to stay the winter. Many succeeded, many didn't but it really showed that humans are capable of enduring such cold and insane conditions. Um, then became the era of the world wars, which showed the hiatus in the, develop in the scientific development because people were otherwise uh, involved. However, the war era, as we know, increased incredibly the technolog technological advancements. Uh, for example, aircrafts, which were then uh, used also in Antarctica, and also aerial photography became a huge improvement in not only Antarctica, but other kinds of scientific fields. So even though during the wars, we didn't see many improvements in specifically in Antarctica, in general, the te technolo technological uh, advancements really improved our scientific uh, knowledge in general. So after the war, there was, after the wars, both of the world wars, there was obviously, the political situation was quite difficult, also in Antarctica, because there were quite a few nations that tried to have their own selection of, uh, of the continent. You may have seen this uh, map of Antarctica that is divided into these triangles. Uh, that is from that era, because different countries tried to take their own little part, but these triangles overlapped, and it was all pretty much a mess. So 
the real, real big breakthrough in the science of Antarctica came in the years 1957 to 1958, which is known as the International Geophysical Year. And that year really represented the unifying forces of science coming together, countries sort of putting aside their political agendas in a way, uh, and really focusing on improving our knowledge about geophysics. And Antarctica, together with outer space, was one of the focuses uh, of that program. Because there was, as a scientist said, there was lack of really comprehensive knowledge about Antarctica at that time. And because the technology was getting there, it was important to take advantage of that. So what, some of the most important advances at that time, so the years 57, 58, were that Russia and the US launched satellites into the space. And uh, that way, as we know now, we can take very, very high resolution satellite images of Antarctica, of everywhere else in the world also. But that was a huge, huge defeat for the Antarctic research. Also, they, there were some very important discoveries made uh, not necessarily about Antarctica, but for example, the importance of uh, mid-ocean ridges, which is hugely important for plate tectonics. And also, uh, uh, earlier we saw pictures of the aurora. Uh, people back in the days didn't know what that was about, but it was during that geophysical year that uh, was really determined. What is aurora borealis? Why do we see it in the northern latitudes? And so on. It was actually a funny thing that the researchers in Antarctica at that time were researching aurora and didn't know what was going on, but the researchers up towards the uh, southern latitudes had figured it out, but there was no way of communicating that to the Antarctica. So in Antarctica, there was still research going on about that. Uh, but of course, when they got back from their mission, they learned that it had been figured out. Um, and then since that geophysical year, which was a huge feat, as I said, there has been continuous, uh, more peaceful, uh, research going on in Antarctica because in 1959 it was the formation of the Antarctic Treaty between the nations that had Antarctic interest in mind. Uh, at that moment it was 12 countries, now it has, uh, uh, I think it's up to 42 countries that have, uh, that are part of the treaty. Uh, and the nations really agreed that the entire continent of Antarctica is only meant for non-political scientific research. There's there's no political agendas, there is no economic interest, not, if anyone finds oil, they are not allowed to use it. And that treaty is still intact today and everyone is really keeping, holding on to that. And as we know, it's a little bit different in the Arctic where there's some geopolitical uh, indifferences at the moment, but the Antarctica is fairly stable when we speak politically. Um, so since the Antarctic Treaty, there has been as I said, like a general increase of uh, scientific explorations and discoveries. One of the main ones probably between then and now is the ozone hole, which was discovered above Antarctica in the stratosphere, uh, meaning that a larger amount or stronger UV rays were able to penetrate through to the, to the Earth. And I think the ozone hole, I'm not 100% an expert about the science behind that, but I think it's an incredible, um, uh, example of how humans have caused such a problem because of the emissions of CFCs into the atmosphere. The ozone hole was created, but then as the Montreal Protocol uh, banned CFCs from the entire, from use in the entire, uh, all the nations, actually the ozone hole has shrinked quite a lot. So it's, a, it's an example how humans can cause a problem, but also kind of deal with it and uh, take care of it. Um, but that brings me to today and uh, the science that is done in Antarctica today, and we have heard some very specific examples about the oceanography. Um, but I would like to, as I said, focus on the climate change of, uh, of it all, because in my opinion, everything, all, at least for the earth sciences part of the research done in Antarctica, they all have the same goal, to find out what is the forces behind the changes that are happening in the world right now, in the environment, so climate change, and how do these changes that are happening in Antarctica then feed back to the global systems? Because we are worried about our future and we do need to find out what will happen, why is it happening, and so on. So when, I had a nice slide about it, but when we have a, when I'm thinking about the issues in Antarctica when regarding climate change, there are three main things that I'm thinking about. First, in general, 
is the, is the Antarctic climate, is it warming? Is the surface warming? Are the seas warming? What is the data there? Secondly, how is the ice in Antarctica? Uh, is it melting? Is it increasing? What, what is the data there? And then thirdly, how is the ice melting or not melting, depending on what it is, I will tell you about that. Uh, how is it affecting the global sea level? Because that is really the change that we could feel globally if it had happened in Antarctica. So I'll start with the temperatures in Antarctica. In general, uh, for those of you that are not, uh, haven't heard of it, there's this term, this phenomenon called polar amplification, which means that temperatures, uh, mean temperatures in polar areas in the south, uh, in the south and in the north are increasing more than the global average. And even though that is true, especially for the Arctic, where the mean temperatures are actually almost two degrees more than uh, the global average, the temperatures in Antarctica are actually increasing a little bit less than the global average. But the reason for that is that Antarctica is so vast, so big and so remote. So uh, different areas of Antarctica are warming slash cooling differently. So if you imagine the map of Antarctica in front of you, <laughs> Uh, there is the uh, there is the Antarctic Peninsula, that little wonky bit that goes up, and the West Antarctic kind of uh, little, not really sure how to call it, but it's very distinctive on the map. Those areas are actually warming quite quite a lot. But then, if you have the rest of the Antarctic, the entire east of Antarctica, which is a huge huge landmass, that area is experiencing actually even some cooling temperatures, especially the South Pole itself. The area around South Pole is cooling quite a lot. The re some, some people theorize that that is because there is a polar vortex. There, is, there are these winds that go around the South Pole that are keeping that warm air actually out. So there are areas there that are actually uh, cooling down compared to what we have now. Um, so it's diffi very difficult to say what is the net trend, what is the, the mean, the average, because there are different areas that act differently. Um, even though we might know some of the reasons for the cooling, we actually don't know why there are spe specific regions in Antarctica that are warming quite a lot. So that brings me to the ice, which we know there is a lot of in Antarctica. Um, the general trend, the general uh, opinion is that the Antarctic ice is melting, especially the ice sheet, uh, because we can differentiate between the sea ice and the ice shelves and the, and the ice sheet. So the ice sheet that is actually covering the entire continent, that is melting. But again, it's very, it depends on the region. So uh, same with the warming, the West Antarctic parts are, uh, de the ice is decreasing quite a lot and in quite a fast rate also. But there are parts in the East Antarctica that are experiencing ice growth and especially when it comes to sea ice. That is because as temperatures warm, precipitation increases. We have more snowfall. But if the temperatures on the, on the ground are still below zero, the snow that falls will create more ice because it will freeze. So there are some changes because of climate change. We have more snowfall. But because the temperatures are still below zero, that actually increases the ice. So there is some data uh, showing that uh, when we think of the global mean sea level, Antarctica is actually not contributing to the sea level. It is taken away. So if Greenland ice sheet in the north is melting and contributing to the global sea level and making it rise, Antarctica is actually doing the opposite. But there are very high uncertainties in that data. And again, it's very regional in Antarctica. And it's very difficult to say, is this really happening? Will this happen in the future? Because uh, when, I, when I'm reading the most important scientific report about climate change, which is the IPCC, the, the main word that they use is uncertainty, and that really comes up when you, we talk about Antarctica. It's still, even today, so remote, so geographic, geographically difficult to get there, to explore it. it the climat climatic conditions are still so harsh that we still don't have the full picture. We still don't have the entire answer, what is happening in, Anta in Antarctica. And I think that is the main thing, that the technology has come such a long way. It is so... It is incredible the difference between 200 years ago and today. I think people back then couldn't even dream of some of the instruments that we have today. You can simply put a sensor in your ship and you get all these different kinds of data. It is incredible. But the uncertainties are still there. And uh, the basic scientific uh, conclusions in the IPCC don't really show us uh, well beyond the year 2100. 
And they also bring out that there is a possibility that when all these warming, increased snowfall, and all these forces come together beyond 2100, the implications could actually be much, much worse. Because if, uh, for example, in this far dystopian future, the entire Antarctic ice sheet would melt, we would see a mean sea level rise increase of 60 meters if the entire uh, ice sheet would melt. You can only imagine the land that will be lost then. And uh, that is only the Antarctic ice sheet. We're not talking about Greenland, which is about five meters increase. We're not talking about the glaciers uh, inland. So there are significant implications that could happen, but we don't really have this, uh, the data to go beyond 2100. Uh, but there, is, there are opinions to say that the implications of climate change beyond that year could actually be disastrous when it comes to Antarctica. So Antarctica so far and until 2100 hasn't really, it doesn't perhaps uh, contribute so much to our global uh, climate change and the impacts that we are seeing here, for example. But if we look way beyond the next 100 years, there could be some serious uh, consequences. However, the uncertainties are there. So my, I think my point is to finish it off, is that we have come a long way in our knowledge and understanding about Antarctica, but there is still so much more to, do, to learn. And as Antarctica changes, we will have an increased amount of things to learn because we have to learn about the changes also. Thank you very much. Thank you.